Our nonprofit will soon be acquired by another larger organization. We are wondering what to do with our restricted donations since we won't be able to fulfill the intended purpose. Mm, yikes. That's scary. So it depends on what you mean when you say our nonprofit will be acquired by a larger organization. Because there's typically we don't see acquisitions. Acquisitions are not a nonprofit thing. Acquis that's a business word, that's a for-profit word where one company will buy another company. So if that's what's happening, you need to hit the exit faster than you possibly can imagine because something horribly wrong is happening. Um, so you can't really be acquired. What you can be is you can be merged, which means the two organizations, the, the boards will combine in some way and the operations of the two organizations will, will sort of connect and do the same thing together. So that's a merger. The other thing would be a dissolution. And that's when a nonprofit just goes away and its assets are transferred to another organization that's doing similar work. And every nonprofit, when you initially file for your 501c3, you fill out the 1023 at the beginning of your nonprofit life. And one of the things that you have to do in the 1023 is, is have a dissolution clause, which explains if something happens and this nonprofit needs to stop existing, what happens to the assets? And usually it's something super generic, like we will transfer our assets to another organization in similar space, blah, 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 right? That is the sentence. So if you are dissolving, the restrictions on your donations go away unless they can be, they can be picked up by the organization that's absorbing you. So if you're a nonprofit organization working, giving scholarships to kids, and you're being absorbed by another organization that does not do that, um, number one, someone's going to question, a donor could possibly question whether or not you're following your dissolution clause properly. Because if you're following your dissolution clause improperly, you're giving your, you know, you're like, ah, we decided puppies. So we're going to give all our money to the SPCA or some, you know, some animal rescue foundation, even though that's not what we were supposed to do. That's not how you're allowed to dissolve based on your dissolution clause. Um, so that's, that's one side of it. If it is truly a merger, then, then you should be keeping all those restrictions because technically you're going to be able to do those things as well. Andy, do you think that doing that, I know sometimes when I've seen mergers happen, some of the programs may continue, certain aspects may continue, some may go away. And I'm wondering if it's referring to something like that, what would happen in that case? Then you need to, I mean, the, the right thing to do is to reach back out to the donor and say, we're, we're unable to comply with your restriction. What, what do you want us to do? Because, and, and there's some, some confusion too, is about the term restriction. Um, so restriction means that a donor has given you some money and has put some requirements on how you're supposed to spend the money, but they're really just suggestions. You, you can spend the money the way the donor hasn't has, and they'll just never donate to you again. Um, the other kind is, is whether or not, and, and you're tracking those differently on your, on your financial statements than you are if truly that money can be clawed back. So if the money can be clawed back, if they say, we're only going to give you this money, if now that's a condition and a condition is different from a restriction, conditional gifts. If you can't comply with what they want you to have for the condition, you don't get to keep the money. You have to give it back. Um, so restrictions are less, they're more, how do I say this? Restrictions are, they're a requirement. You need to do it. But if you don't comply with the restriction, it's not the end of the world. You just don't want to do that a lot. And your auditors are going to say, you had restricted funds and you did not comply with the restrictions. It's going to show up as potentially an audit finding. Um, as part of a merger, if, if an organization is being absorbed, that might be not that big of a deal. You might not, you be, might be okay with that, just knowing that just what happened to the organization. Um, but you are not making friends with your donors. Your donors are not going to be happy about that if they've given you money for a particular purpose and you can't spend it for that purpose. I think one exception could be, I have seen, and this happens, tends to happen in larger organizations where there's a sizable gift and there's a gift agreement form letter that truly states, outlines exactly what the restriction is. And if this can't be met, by this date, time, or for this purpose, or whatever, here's a refund 
clause in it. And I know I've seen those before. So that's, that's a condition. So, so a conditional gift is different from a restricted gift. And this confuses everybody. This, I, I have conversations with CFOs that run multi-million dollar organizations and are still confused by the difference between a conditional gift and a restricted gift. So if, if, you know, and the don't, and I mean, God forbid, can you imagine the foundations have no idea what they're talking about most of the time anyway. And so they may say, this is the restriction, but then unintentionally make it a conditional gift based on the rest of the language. So it's up to the nonprofit finance folks, treasurer, auditor, bookkeeper to say, oh, this is actually conditional, not restricted. So we don't count it as revenue. It goes in as a liability and we can only release the reliability into revenue once we've met the, cons- once we've met the condition. It's very confusing. Very confusing. Nonprofit governance. Nonprofit answers. Nonprofit board. Nonprofit management. Nonprofit marketing. Nonprofit resources. Welcome to Nonprofit Everything, the podcast where hosts Andy Shurek and Stacy Wedding answer your questions about all things nonprofit. It's the Nonprofit Everything Podcast, which you know because you've already heard at least one question answered because that's how it works. <laughs> we have the question first, and then we've got the tagline, which sounds so good. And then we have us just rambling for a couple of minutes just to remind you that we're actually, um, I don't know. I don't even know why we do this part. I think we just just sort of inertia Is it just a at thing? This Is this just like a thing? Like one of those things you just do when you have a podcast? I think so. I mean, so... It's a good question. I think if it was just the Q and A, it would feel really, um, I don't know, not very human. Just like, yeah. like he's like, yeah. Have you ever been like at a party and like there's somebody comes up and you're just like talking to somebody and all they do is ask you questions. And you're like, that's not how conversations work. Like <laughs> you don't just talk. You just don't like ask and answer questions. That's really weird. You have to have like a human conversation, like talk about normal things. <laughs> so I think this part of it is supposed to be just us talking about normal things. Um, and not just specifically answering nonprofit questions. And you may fast forward through it. I know, I know when I listen to podcasts, I fast forward through all of this stuff and any commercials and anything else. Well, I fast forward through it because it's usually the exact same intro. Now we mix it up with different intros. So Mm -hmm. see, that's what (laughs) makes us unique. We get a gold star. Could also be like, um, when someone's kidnapped, right? And they hold up like a newspaper with like the date on it. So you know that the <laughs> they're still alive whenever the thing was taped, right? It could be like that too. <laughs> so you know that we're actually, we're not, we're, neither Stacey and I are being held hostage, being required to do this. Like no one's <laughs> forcing us to do this. So, <laughs> um, so we'll say all the boring things we usually do. Um, thanks for listening. Send us your questions. Nonprideaboutereverything.com. Social media is a good way to reach out to us. There's also a Discord. If you want to just ask us random questions in the middle of the night, there's a chance we're on and we'll just answer you immediately. You never know. Um, and with that, we're going to actually do what we're, we said we were going to do and stop babbling and answer some nonprofit questions. I am on the board of a nonprofit whose executive director recently tendered his resignation. He gave us four weeks notice, which we appreciate. Our board is wondering what role interim EDs usually play if there is a typical tenure for an interim and whether there is anything an interim ED should not be allowed to do since they are not a permanent employee. So I'm going to start this question by, by taking it from the former interim ED position, which is I've actually made a vow that I would never in my career for after that point ever take a role, any role that had the word interim at the front of it. So, and here's why exactly the question that you just asked, which is what does this person, what is this person allowed to do? How long should they be here? What should we prevent them from doing? You are now once, I mean, even thinking those thoughts out loud, you are now breaking the rule about what a board is supposed to do. The board is the governance of an organization. Their job is to look at it from the top and make sure that everything is running properly. They have delegated all of their authority to the top level executive at the organization, which is typically the executive director. If you do not have an executive director, you have to decide what role you want somebody to play during the time that you find whoever you're going to put this person into this position. So either 
you break the rules and you start doing all the things that the ED did, or you nominate somebody in the organization that's currently at the organization or bring in somebody from the outside that's willing to do that for a temporary period of time. Uh, and just make it clear that if, if you really don't think that that person's fit for the job long term, or maybe you're outsourcing it to someone who's retired and has decided, yeah, I'll, I guess I'll do that for a couple of weeks while you get your act together. But I don't think that you should set any additional rules or requirements on what that person's allowed to do. They're the executive director during that time. And as the board, your your job is to steer them and make them understand what the priorities are and that kind of stuff. But But don't bring in somebody and say, yeah, you can have this job, but you can't do all of these things because you're not permanent. We're just going to hire somebody else. I mean, especially if you're bringing up somebody from within the organization that's already there, somebody at a lower level position that you're like, well, you couldn't ever possibly be the executive director, but we we trust you enough to do it for four weeks <laughs> or six weeks or however long we go out to to find our search firm that's going to do the actual thing for me. I think you just have to, you know, number one, you should have some sort of uh, plan in place. You should know the board is supposed to know what's going to happen when the ED inevitably decides to leave. And you should have had that plan in place to begin with so that you're not asking a podcast this question. <laughs> you're being a little snarky, my friend. No, you one over over cocktails. Somebody can ask me my interim ED my about my interim ED experience. And I'm I'm happy to talk about that. Okay. I have, I think I have a slightly different stance on this. So I'm, it'll be fun to talk about this with you. So I was an interim for about six months. So I understand that that was many, many moons ago. And I was very much told we are not looking for you to grow this. We are not looking for you to to make, we want status quo. We want to keep the doors open and whatever you've got to do to maintain status quo. So we're not looking for big revolutionary changes. And you weren't insulted. No, I was also really young. So maybe that's why. You just didn't know enough to be insulted. Maybe that was it. I still though, I look at interims as there's two types of interims. You've got one that's like a turnaround expert or like we want you to do all the things because we need an objective neutral standpoint and then there's some that it's like, we really just want to be intentional that we weren't prepared. Shame on us. We didn't have that succession plan in place. And we don't want to rush a process and hire someone wrong. So we're looking for, you know, kind of basic everyday ED stuff. And, and without, uh, because, because Andy, think about it. You bring someone, let's say you bring someone in from the outside or you bring someone in from the inside who really just doesn't have a clue and starts making really crappy decisions. They're, they're firing staff. They're making all these changes that the organization maybe that like it was too soon. They didn't have enough time. I don't know. That's where, where I see it a little differently. Like, and I think because the boards, one of the board's primary roles is hiring, evaluating and potentially letting go an executive director, even an interim. I, I think in this circumstance, cause it's not a permanent position, I don't think it's the end of the world if the board's playing a little bit more oversight, watching things, making sure that everything isn't turning like overnight, especially if the board said that's not what they wanted. Like that could destroy an organization and set it 10 steps backward if you have the wrong interim. You think differently, though. I, the, it's, a, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting position to be in. To have to have an organization lose an executive director. It happens all the time. And the organization set up in such a way that the board's job is to oversee the work of the executive director. If they have no one to oversee, then then they don't have anything to do. So either they need to put themselves in the position of doing the jobs that the ED did or they need to let the organization just run until they can find somebody to fill that position. So in a in a well in a well run organization so i think maybe we're talking about two different things so in a well run organization not having an ed for an extended period of time is not going to hurt the organization at all like because there's no opportunity to make big strategic decisions because nobody's in that role to make those big strategic decisions so so in an organization that's that's sort of well run that has enough people to do all the work where the ed was doing ed type jobs which is what they're supposed to be doing, which is overseeing staff and making sure the strategic direction of the organization is correct and interfacing with the board and all that kind of stuff. That's, I think that's okay. 
Um, in an organization that's not, where you absolutely have to have somebody sitting in that seat, I think my answer would be different. So, so I think maybe, I think you and I are thinking of two different situations in two different organization sizes. And I agree with you. If it's a tiny org or there's the opportunity, if we, you know, if we bring that COO or we bring that operations director up into the ED position, everyone hates him and he's going to fire everybody and we're going to end up with a bigger mess on my hands. I mean, absolutely don't do that. <laughs> I'll agree with you there. <laughs> yes. And, I, you know, the person who wrote this also asked about the tenure. I mean, I think that varies. I, like I said, I was one for six months. I don't know how long you were one, Andy. Uh, it was so long. It hurts my ears to think about. It makes you bleed like your your ears and eyes are bleeding right now. I can see them. So, yeah, it was it was an unpleasant experience. It was an absolute unpleasant experience. I didn't. And and mine was, I mean, just being honest, because I, I think we have to talk about the realities of it. Uh, it costs money to bring in an interim. I mean, obviously, you've got maybe freed up salary from the ED. But I think in my case, it was, I mean, I look back, the board had, I'm honored and flattered. I got that opportunity and they thought well enough of me. And I think it was a cost-saving measure and they didn't know what the heck they were doing. I didn't know what I was doing at the age I was serving in that role. I figured it out, right? <laughs> I, I, I was smart enough to lean on peers who did know what they were doing and help me through it. And yet I, I just sit there and I kind of laugh and go, okay, that was probably not like in my consulting ro- role these days. I would never tell someone to do like put someone like me at that time, no matter if I was a rock star or not. Like I, I had no business doing that. And I, you know, thank God I didn't do anything horrible and the organization didn't self-destruct. So. <laughs> oh. Anyway, I do, I do think there's a lot of factors, but I think the tenure, I mean, in general, like when you look at research out there, they'll say it's anywhere from like three to nine or 10 months tends to be the the span of time. I think it really depends on where the organization's at, how much time the board needs to get their act together to figure out what kind of leader they want to recruit and, and fill. And it can be messy. I don't, I'm not against it because I also think there's challenges. I think my first step would be a staff member who could fill in, but I think there's challenges when board members step into that role. I think that's where I've seen a lot of horror stories because I I don't know if those board members are ever able to step out of that role. And when they step into a role of interim, they need to step out, out of their board role. And it just, none of that ever happens cleanly. And uh, I, that I've seen, I mean, I'm sure it could happen, but I think it's rare that that happens well either. So I'm like promote from within if you can. Hopefully you've got a a team or someone you can groom that as you said the organization's running well enough or you find someone externally and you got to be really clear as a board what it is it goes back to what what your expectation is being super clear with that communication up front so that person doesn't run completely rogue if that's not what you're wanting. Mm-hmm. And and if if this isn't you asking the question and this is everybody else Make sure you have a leadership succession plan in place that you've thought about how that works. Make the board sign off on it. Make sure it's really, really clear because it happens all the time. This isn't something that should surprise you. No. And it's something that no one wants to, like, I I don't think people want to deal with the realities. I think there's this sensitivity around it. Like, oh, bringing up succession is going to scare, scare my executive director, CEO, whatever the title is. Absolutely not. That person should want it too. And that person should be thinking about it and be your thought partner in it as a board if you're doing this well (laughs) so that you're not caught by surprise fumbling. And it can get messy quickly when you don't have a plan in place. I mean, I'll just I'll just say you can see organizations that even are well functioning and don't have a plan in place and it, it can do some damage. As it sounds like you can relate to, Andy. That is, that is true, <laughs> but that's a story for another time. <laughs> I'm going to take you out for drinks now because I want to hear the story. All right, Andy, this is an interesting one. I recently saw a job posting for an executive director position that reports to a CEO. I have lots of questions related to this. so. If you only want to choose a few, I totally understand. Is this a typical structure? And how does this type of structure work? 
when usually it's just one person who's at the top? What are the pros and cons as well? Well, and I, I see sort of what what the 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 person asking the question, I kind of see what they're asking. Because typically when you hear CEO, it means the top person in the organization that reports to the board. And when you hear executive director, you think the top person in the organization that reports to the board. Um, but as as we know, because it's 2022, job titles are just words that are kind of put in order that may have that have no meaning on anything other than they're attached to a job description, which explains what the roles and responsibilities of that organization or that that position are. So. So, yeah, at first blush, this does look like it could be like a co-CEO thing or um, or, or some other structure. Maybe like you would typically call that executive director position if this were structured normally. Um, you would consider like a vice president of something like cause just one under the CEO. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't get super worried about it until I saw the job description. Like maybe the job description is problematic, but I can see this this sort of structure with even these exact same job titles. If you imagine maybe like a a national organization where there's the CEO of the whole national organization. Then, and you have an executive director of a local branch. I mean, that, that would make sense to me. So, so yeah, if you're interested in the position um, and you, and you, you want to be number two, which is, I, I always liked being the person who wasn't ultimately responsible for everything, but the person who still had an awful lot of power. I liked that position a lot. Um, if that's something for you, yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Uh, ask for the job description and make sure it's exactly what you want to do. Um, but it, it doesn't sound like it is your typical, like the person who reports to the board position. here. And I do think this sort of is a, it, this is an example of shaking things up because as we know, if anything has happened the last few years, things have, have just really changed and the workforce has changed and trying to just find employees and retain them is difficult. So, so I, I'm seeing a lot more nationally, a lot of different structures and this, so, so no, do I think this was typical? Do I still think this is a typical structure? No. Do I think things are moving in directions that are a little more creative? Yes. And you see the co-EDs, you see, there's even one organization I read about once who had three executive directors. I mean, Imagine that. That's like mind blowing. And Andy, you're laughing. <laughs> Impossible. That's just too many. <laughs> it, is too many. it is too many. So, so I guess, I guess nothing's out of the box. And I, I love, I kind of want to say hats off to organizations looking to mix it up and innovate and create new models because gone are the days of doing business as usual. So that's one thing. And, and the other thing is, I mean, there's pros and cons with every model out there. I think in general, with something like that was structured like what you've asked in the question where there's an ED reporting to a CEO. I think because there could be potential confusion out there, the job description clarity and the communication internally, externally, and between those two roles is critical, right? Without that, this it, it could get messy. Uh, but But making sure that both parties know where they sort of start, stop, overlap, is is important and making sure that they're clear enough so they can articulate that when these kinds of questions come up or when staff get, you know, if staff get a little confused or say, well, wait, you know, I don't understand, whatever. Like it's all this kind of stuff takes takes time and it's all about change and change management. There's there's some really cool though, what gets me excited about the idea of of I'm gonna call it kind of shared leadership. What gets me excited about it is the idea that it really mixes up the pot without putting it all on one person's shoulders and having perhaps someone who's better as a visionary or be a growth expert or strategist versus someone who maybe is more comfortable and their strength is more in day-to-day -day management of an organization. I love the idea of being able to have that flexibility where you play on people's strengths, you have diversity of strengths, and you're honoring both of those to, to help just build up and make the organization even stronger than it is. Oh, Andy, we got a personal question for both of us. Um, 
this listener said, this is more of a personal question, but I'm curious. When you think about your own philanthropy, what causes or organizations most interest you and why? What draws you to certain organizations? Oh, I love the insider baseball questions, right? We get these every once in a while about like, how do you, you know, when you're looking at somebody's 990, like, what are the things that you, what are the things that you focus on when you decide whether or not you're going to give to a particular organization? And I got to say, for me, it's, it's a hundred percent about like what I think the effectiveness of the overall organization is. Like it doesn't, I don't look at any metrics. I look at zero ratios. I don't look at schedule J. I don't look at anything in the organization, except I want to know what their outcomes are. I want to know how they're doing their job. And if it makes, I mean, but, but again, insider baseball, right? We live in this world. And so we know how it all works. And so we're, we sort of have an intuitive sense of like, that doesn't make any sense, right? <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know what yeah. you're doing, but that yeah. isn't going to work, right? So we like have this feeling that an organization is going to be more effective just based on the way it's designed and the way it presents itself. Um, I guess I could probably be fooled, but fooled, but um, it's, I don't know. I don't think it's particularly likely. As for me, specifically the causes that I'm interested in, um, it's almost exclusively environment and social justice. Um, I think the sort of, you know, this is like the least interesting thing to listen to in the world, I think. But my personal opinion is the kind of the where we are in the world right now. I think we need to kind of learn to be nicer to each other <laughs> as a species and to think about like I, I heard I heard a politician just recently say um, talking about the environment was like, why do I care? Why should I care if Miami is going to be under six feet of water in 60 years? And my initial thought was, what the f- is wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. That feels yeah. like the most like disingenuous thing I've ever heard. Don't you have children? Don't you have grandchildren? Like maybe, maybe think about like what the supermarket, you want the supermarket to look like for your children when they're in their 60s and they're walking around a supermarket. What fruits and vegetables do you want them to be able to buy? Would you like, you know, let's overfish everything so that there's only shrimp left. The only thing they can eat is shrimp and I don't know, avocados. We don't even know what <laughs> yeah. other vegetables yeah. we end up with. Um, but so, so that's the kind of thing is like, I, I like to like most of my philanthropy lives like is around. What do I want the world to be like for my kids? And how can I do that now? What can I put in, put into place now? Or what can I encourage now that will benefit my children when they're old? Yeah. How about no, you, I love that. Um, I think for me, like I, I am very much driven by, so impact is a piece of it. So to your point, like, but I I really think about for me, probably if I were putting it in order, it's first sort of, is there some sort of connection like that I've had in my lifetime or that I can see a direct connection to people I love and care about? So there's very much a personal connection piece that drives it. And then that sort of is coupled with you know, the, the impact of that work, the le- how that work is leveraged for bigger things. So like, this is a really simplistic example and probably not quite what I'm trying to get at, but, um, so right. I'm, I'm a big believer in education, um, children's literacy. That was a huge part of my life. And I believe that can be a game changer for, for kids. Right. And so I sit there and I go, but I also am really passionate about dogs, right? I've got my two rescues. But when you see these causes that are able to somehow like leverage both of those, so teaching kids to read who maybe are having trouble reading or don't have the confidence reading by putting like a dog that's trained in the room with them as their listening buddy, like I get very excited by those sort of magical connections organizations make between two like something that like, it's good for the dog, it's good for the kid, it's good for our future. So I get really excited by kind of those leverage points that organizations are able to make. Um, and and so that's huge, huge for me. But definitely, I would say um, education overall, um, I, I don't know if I can even sort of boil that down. I mean, children's literacy is a piece of that, but education overall is big. Um, I do think sort of animal, like animal, um, you know, just animal welfare and um, this overpopulation problem we have leads to so many other challenges. So anyways, so I'm big into that. 
And I am big into social justice. That's um, been newer for me over the last several years, but that's something that I've paid a lot more attention to and thought about. That's kind of the root of so many of the causes that I have supported is is very much at the fundamental heart of it is social justice. So anyway, um, I appreciate that question. That was kind of, um, that actually got me thinking because sometimes it's easy to get in kind of autopilot with my own philanthropy. And that was like, oh yeah, this is what, what drives the decisions. Well, you did it. You got through another episode of Nonprofit Everything. And I'm going to give you a random factoid about me and see if my co-host Andy will do the same, right? If you want to get to know the people who are, you know, answering these these questions and and our personalities a little bit, maybe we give you like random factoids about us just so you can either laugh or, I don't know, just roll your eyes, whatever, just to mix it up a little bit. So... My random factoid is that I am a thrill seeker. I have been skydiving and I have not done bungee jumping yet, but pretty much every wild roller coaster or thing out there, I love it. It is the thrill of my life. And it's so bizarre because in every other aspect of my life, I'm very, I plan, I'm cautious. So I think that's my free spirit that comes out from time to time. So there's my random factoid. What's yours, Andy? Um, so I grew up in LA and and a lot of the people that grew up in LA, they're just sort of this thing that people the rest of the rest of the country don't realize is that since so much filming of television and movies and things are happening around LA, that there's a high likelihood that you've been an extra in random things. And so um I've, I'm in a couple of movies in the background, just uh, in one, I'm drinking a container of milk. Um, <laughs> when I was a kid, I was a, a boy scout standing at the bottom of a cliff when, um, Ponch and John from chips were up at the top of the cliff <laughs> doing something. Um, so yeah, so I've been an extra in a bunch of movies when I was a kid, <laughs> wow. you know, get paid $50 and free lunch and you didn't have to go to school that day. It was, it was a pretty good gig. <laughs> 